My name is Bart van Arem. I'm from Delft University of Technology and uh, that's from the Netherlands. Um, we focus on transport modeling. So we model uh, transport flows, traffic flows and see how you can influence that with uh, a traffic management. At, but nowadays also increasingly intelligent vehicles can influence traffic flows. So we're trying to understand um, how intelligent vehicles change driving behavior and how that can lead to different traffic flows and preferably less congestion. Um, yes, that's a, that's, a, that's a combination. One of the projects that we are now um, uh, doing, it's, it's, it uses roadside equipment to give a prediction about uh, um, congestion on the roads. So, uh, for instance, the shock waves that you have in traffic that you sometimes you are stationary, then you can move for a bit and they are stationary again. So we can predict how the shock waves are moving and we can send this information to the, to the drivers um, so that they get a better situational awareness of, of the conditions they are uh, about to encounter and uh, uh, change their behavior accordingly. And, uh, and well, the idea is that that can reduce congestion. Oh yeah, that's, that's definitely uh, an issue because um, if you, for instance, process the roadside data, that, that costs you about a minute. To, to collect it, then you need to send it and make the predictions and then send it again, uh, the advice to the, uh, to the driver. So that's about two to three minutes latency that you have. And to deal with that, you need to be uh, able to um, give your predictions about um, 10 minutes ahead or about five kilometers. That's the, uh, that's the idea. Um, well, this is a project that we are now doing. But we, we did some simulations in the past with a, a system that just gives uh, support in congestion. So if you are in congestion and it, it regulates your headway and, uh, and your speed. And, um, and using these simulations, we already could tell that if you equip about 10% of the vehicles with the system, you can uh, reduce the travel, uh, travel time delay by 30%. Well, up to now it has not, we've, we've done not done explicit calculations of the, the energy, but um, I expect that you can gain some 10 to 15 percent on fuel consumption and energy uh, using these type of technologies, just by making traffic more, more smoother. Um, yes, when you have eco-friendly systems, there are, there are different, different angles uh, uh, that you can approach it. And one, of course, is the car and the, the propulsion system to make it cleaner. And electric, uh, electrification is a very a uh, good example of that, but given the systems that we have uh, today, we don't have electric vehicles yet, but we do have all kinds of driver support systems. We have um, uh, traffic control systems and we can use them to make traffic uh, much, uh, much smoother and uh, save um, um, the, uh, the emissions on, uh, for instance, particulate matter or uh, uh, CO2. Yeah, well, the first, uh, the first part where you can save is um, the, the normal driving style, so driving less aggressively, uh, to anticipate better, uh, avoiding uh, full stops, avoiding uh, strong uh, acceleration. So these are all things that, uh, uh, that, that matter. And the, the second part is that you can also choose uh, which route to take. Uh, because uh, a route with a lot of hills and where you hit a lot of congestion and have a lot of junctions, uh, this can be a route that uh, may be quicker or may be shorter than another route, but uh, you will um, use more fuel on such routes compared with a, a route where you just take the highway. Well, the most common um, channel that you use nowadays is, uh, is, is 3G. That you, uh, um, so it's just a cellular phone um, that, uh, that, that has the information. And... Um, um, Inside the car, the, the interface to the driver is, uh, is, is very crucial because if you want uh, uh, people to uh, show a certain behavior to be more eco-friendly, for instance, uh, then you need to present the information or advice to, uh, in a way that the driver is going to, uh, to accept it and, and show this behavior. Well, yes, um, it could be your own cell phone. For instance, if you use your cell phone as a navigation device, that's, that could very well be the case. But also if you have these uh, uh, nomadic uh, navigation devices, um, they are also being equipped with, uh, um, with SIM cards. And, uh, and in this way, they can also receive the information from the outside world. And um, what you also see nowadays is that the car is being equipped with a SIM card as well. So you also be able to get the information uh, through the uh, in-car uh, interface. 
I guess the future challenge is uh, to um, uh, include also vehicle-vehicle and vehicle infrastructure communication. So um, uh, we have um, systems that now are uh, standalone systems, uh, uh, more or less, and uh, by being able to communicate with other vehicles, um, you could anticipate uh, to the movements of the vehicles in your direct uh, vicinity. Uh, so you could um, follow other vehicles uh, uh, in a way that would resemble human driving uh, uh, in a much better way. Because um, normally if you have a system like adaptive cruise control, it will uh, enable you to follow the vehicle that's just in front of you. And when you compare that to normal driving, um, in normal driving, you look at the vehicle in front of you, but you also look at the other vehicles downstream, you kind of anticipate to that. And if you add vehicle-vehicle communication, like having a local area network uh, for these different vehicles, uh, you'll be able to also use that information in your, uh, uh, your driver assistance. Uh, you, can do, you can do both. Um, I think the vehicles can communicate uh, um, among themselves uh, about the location and their, and their speed. But, um, for instance, if you have roadside systems involved, you could relay the information uh, much further upstream and uh, vehicles would be able to, uh, to anticipate better to that, uh, that information. And you could also um, give information um, that's provided by the road operator, for instance, information about uh, incidents, information about uh, roadworks or parking conditions uh, that could be transferred directly to the vehicle. Well, I do think that also public transport is getting more intelligent, and uh, that's uh, that's the way to go. I think the uh, one of the the major developments now is that uh, we have real-time traffic information on the roads, but we also have real-time information about the operation of the public transport system, and we have that on our PDAs, so we can have seamless mobility. So uh, we can park our car somewhere and take the train into a a crowded city centre. So we get more combinations and I think also ITS and public transport is uh, emerging a lot. So it will be a combination of both. Well, if you consider nowadays cars and equip them with uh, all kinds of intelligent vehicles, that our intelligent system, that can be done on the short term. And um, there are actually two approaches to that. One is the, the regular driving behavior uh, where you can have systems supporting a driver um, to avoid stopping, uh, to avoid sharp uh, uh, accelerations and decelerations. So driving much more smoothly and this could save uh, uh, a lot of fuel and also save emissions. So this is one way. Um, the other way is uh, by letting uh, systems help a driver to choose the most fuel efficient routes. And uh, um, mo most efficient fuel efficient routes um, would be those routes where you don't have congestion, uh, where you have uh, no slopes, where you have the least amount of stops. And the fuel efficient routes would, for instance, be uh, the freeways where you have a kind of constant speed, for instance. So systems could help people identify the conditions on different roads and advise the driver on the most fuel efficient uh, uh, route. Um, I think it's already there. Um, there are navigation devices that already uh, uh, give these, uh, these routes. I think the main challenge is also uh, to have the uh, uh, up-to-date data in our digital maps because that's, uh, uh, that's a, a big job to, uh, to fulfill because the data has to be there. But uh, this is a, a development that's going to take place in a couple of years. Um, I think the critical research challenge is trying to predict the, the response of drivers to new systems. So if you have the regular driving behavior and then you add to that all new kinds of systems. And there's one thing that we know for sure, that the driver will behave differently. But will the driver behave in the way that we expect him to behave? Well, probably not. So probably the driver will have some kind of compensation um, in his behavior and, uh, and uh, we hope that the uh, overall effect will be, uh, will be positive. But, um, that's, that's one of the crucial research fields, how to really get the, uh, the desired behavior of the, uh, of the driver and to help the system to cooperate with the driver. So it really needs to be a combination of a driver and a system instead of uh, just the system helping the driver. Yes, I, I guess um, there are multiple sciences uh, involved here because, uh, for instance, uh, a lot of research is being done on driver state estimation, even the estimation of the emotional state of the, uh, of the driver or driver intention. 
you need technology, you need sensing equipment to do that. You also need mathematical modeling to understand it and to see how a driver is, is going to react to, uh, to system. And you need a lot of psychology uh, uh, to do that. So it's an uh, interesting and challenging field that's, uh, that's, that's unfolding here. Thank you very much. You're welcome.